This week we're just speaking with David Stout. David Stout works with my friend Corey Metcalf. Uh, the duo works as Noisefold, doing really innovative live visuals and audio generation. Uh, very much performers and very much on the cutting edge of the intellectual thought that goes behind the development of a, of a high scale performance. It's been a pretty tough week here at my casa. I dumped a hard drive on my laptop, which unfortunately looked like it was going to take out the interview. But thanks to single user mode and some really great help on the internet, I was able to pull all of my old work off of the laptop before it got put to bed. Took it in the Apple store, found out that I had it 200 days past the end of Apple Care, so pointless but at least i recovered my data and thankfully that included this interview so without further ado here you go okay this week we're going to be talking with david stout david stout works at unt he's also a performing artist with the group noisefold um, i ran into them a few years ago and was pretty stunned by what they had put together in terms of real-time performance of both visuals and audio. Um, really innovative stuff, and there's a lot for us to talk about. So rather than getting wrapped up in my vision of it, let's have let's talk to David. Hi, David. How are you? I'm doing good, Darwin. Why don't we kick this off by having you give us a little bit of your background? Okay. Well, I can uh, start, uh, start with... Just an overview of my formal studies because I began as a as a painting major, um, but fairly early on in my studies, I became really interested in the possibilities of multiple disciplines interacting with each other. So from there, I started working uh, in music and in contemporary dance, and also creative writing while still maintaining my interest in the visual arts and. This was sort of uh, prior to any kind of work in technology other than electronic music. So electronic music being a really uh, key component of that. And all of that led into video, and, and which ultimately uh, was at the, sort of the very end of the analog era as we were, we were transforming into digital. So... Uh, so analog thinking really has a lot to, to do with, I think, with my uh, approach, uh, as does this idea of the interdisciplinary and the multidisciplinary. Right, that makes sense. Um, it's really interesting because uh, it sounds like you sort of uh, decided to embrace things relatively early in your uh, educational I mean, uh, it was it was definitely you know it's the kind of thing that I don't, wouldn't necessarily advise my students to do because, <laughs> because it was very radical and it was not really met, my 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 professors did not all stand behind it that's for sure but uh, oddly uh, it is really the, the curriculum that I drafted for myself and the way that I approached it has really become what it, the way that we would think about a foundation for anyone studying digital media, because of course digital media is this, this hybrid animal that uh, borrows from all of the arts disciplines, and then of course also from other aspects of science and humanities as well. Right, yeah, it's, it's funny because uh, back in the day, interdisciplinary studies was sort of like the way that they would package up what you'd all, the classes you'd already taken just so they could get you out of school. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, and uh, yeah, and I, I've definitely had to deal with that on both ends of either uh, being a student and also being a professor um, promoting this kind of work because there is what, from my vantage point, I often see the sort of visionary high achievers are sort of in one in one camp, and then there are the, pe the the people that are skating in the other, and oftentimes they're they're both trying to get interdisciplinary degrees. Right, right. So um, after your studies, uh, some period of time occurred, and then you ended up down in Santa Fe. Um, did you did you uh, come right out of school and get into teaching, or did you have some period of time that you were doing something else? 
you know, it's funny because I now am an academic or at least an artistic uh, academic, uh, but that was not a focus. I mean, I see that much more with students now to figure that out and aim at that direction. I actually had this crazy idea that I was going to be a, an artist and that I was going to stick to that path. Uh, but in the process, first of all, we all know that that's, that's difficult. Yes, uh, there, there are paths that we can take. Some of them are, you know, maybe more in a populist vein or a commercial vein. Uh, and even if you're going to go into the most experimental kind of work, it, it's, it's its own sort of set of hoops you have to uh, jump through. And it has a business aspect as well. So I, I think I was always really interested in the research aspect and found that I was good at teaching. But after I got my um, MFA, which was at, at CalArts, um, for a while, I w- was doing multiple things. I was working freelance, uh, doing music. Uh, I was doing video, uh, working on commercial projects. I mean, I even wrote a big rap tune for Apple computers. I mean, I did <laughs> anything I could, I could do, right? Uh, but I was also um, teaching uh, an interdisciplinary class called the Inner Arts Workshop at um, CalArts. And, and then I started teaching some other stuff and found that I not only enjoyed it, but that I was good at it, at least certain aspects of these sort of creative laboratory cross-disciplinary classes in particular, uh, which would often have a technical component to them, but they weren't purely just uh, technique. So at some point I decided that um, that this might be the actual this was what maybe made sense for me because I wanted to continue to do my work. And a lot of the people I knew who were working in Hollywood or doing freelance work were so burned out by the 14 and, you know, plus hour days that they weren't doing their work. Right. So it seemed, it seemed like a val- a valuable way. I, this was also at that period of time. Like I was very fortunate when I first graduated, I, I walked right into a very large NEA grant and then we, of course, had the, the, the famous moment with Piss Christ and right. et cetera. Where it all came uh, crashing it, down. Yeah. It, it all came crashing down. And then everybody wanted a, uh, you know, a teaching job. So I was just slightly ahead of that. Well, I was kind of like in the middle of that moment right. when I decided that I, would, I would teach. So, um, what, what was the institute in Santa Fe that you were teaching at? I, I was at the College of Santa Fe. College of Santa Fe, which, right. Yeah, which, uh, and I was, specifically I was in the film video program there, but I was very fortunate to ha- uh, work with some very progressive people and was able to found a new media track and a collaborative, it was kind of a collaborative arts meets new media track within a film program. And we were very entrepreneurial and very well equipped. So the tech base for us was really quite good. Well, that's cool. And now while you were there is when you developed the idea for, uh, for the noiseful performing group, correct? Yeah. Well, I can't, I mean, that's, that of course has its own, its own kind of really interesting, uh, story, but, um, I, I was, I guess the first thing that happened, I, uh, relative to working with, uh, Corey Metcalf was uh, I was working with Stana Basulka and she and I had known each other before I moved to Santa Fe and she and of course she and Woody live in Santa Fe and she had been developing uh, Imagine at Stein which was really one of the very first and it's an you know it's an arguable point but we can say the first uh, digital program to model a kind of modular. Uh, analog video environment video process and right. yes and so she uh, let's see that the program had been in use by her pretty much for about a year and so she and I uh, put together a class doing interactive video and it could well have been one of the very first classes uh, ever in that particular topic and it happened to be that Corey was in that class and we started uh, working together while he was still a student there. And I had uh, went on to do a, a kind of a big live project with another musician. We were touring Europe with it. And Corey was mixing 
he was actually mixing sound. Uh, and we, we really discovered that it was he and I that worked well together. And, um, uh, and so for a moment he was sort of assisting me, but in the process, I got a fellowship at, um, Harvest Works where we met Luke Dubois. Right. And I was working on this, um, A-Life installation project and Corey, Corey and I are both working there and it just became really clear. It's like, well, we should work together. So, uh, from that point on it is when we put together Noisefold, really focused more on performance, but we've been doing a lot of installations as well. Right. Now, one of the things, uh, well, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, some of the things that Noisefold's been doing recently? Okay. Our Well, our uh, most recent work is really focused on bringing other collaborators in, and specifically those collaborators have been acoustic instrumentalists, uh, not really electronic people per se. Uh, typically coming out of more of a classical background, but but sort of really adventurous improvisers. Um, so we work with Francis Marie Ritti, the cellist who uh, lives in Amsterdam, on one project called right, Emanation. I, I, actually, I actually got to see that, and, and that was really a beautiful show that that you guys put together. Yeah, and Frances is just, she's just sort of the perfect collaborator for, for the kinds of the ways that we think about sound and the way that she uh, coaxes sound out of her cello. And then, of course, she she has sort of a monumental technique. So she's, she's up for the challenge of, of sort of equaling or even bettering uh, the, uh, the kind, uh, kinds of density of timbre and stuff that we use, or just intensity of experience. Mm. Uh, and then from there, we are, uh, I mean, that, that uh, collaboration is an ongoing thing, uh, but we then started working with another group called uh, Trio Casa, and they're from, uh, originally from Germany, but they live in different cities, so Berlin, uh, Cologne and Amsterdam, and they are an interesting group because they are a contemporary music group, but they also uh, play early music, and they they play recorders of every shape and size, and they are also have amazing extended techniques. Uh, and so that project is a little is a little bit more lyrical, uh, and a little and I yeah I would I would say it's a little more lyrical, but uh, that, even in its would, it, I wouldn't characterize it totally that way, uh, but it sort of it cha- it really changes the dynamic because there are of course three of them and then, and then Corey and I and so we with that project we uh, adopted a, a very different kind uh, of um, image environment because our older work was unique in that we would perform on two side by side screens as a as a form of a duet. Right. where we each, you know, had responsibility for our own screen and our own sound, but oftentimes we were playing very similar material and the, and the system is networked so we can play each other's screens, but the image from one screen never really was um, really moved into the other person's screen unless we did certain kinds of design tricks, which we did all the time, <laughs> where we would we would we would mirror different aspects of what we were doing on one screen and send that and duplicate it on another screen. Sure. Um, but we, but in a new environment, um, we are actually using a, a HD video mixer and we're composite doing live compositing uh, of various sorts, and so we're both occupying the same screen space, uh, which is actually much more difficult. You have to really be sensitive to how, to how that works. So orchestrating the visual is more intense and just the performance sensitivity is more demanding. Uh, but we were ready. I mean, after, you know, eight, eight years of doing this together, we were definitely ready for the sort of the, the next level. So uh, that project we've, previewed a few studies, but it, we're planning to tour it in 2015. Okay. Now, one of the questions I have in, in any, I mean, even in the collaboration between you and Corey, but especially when you start working with like acoustic musicians, is sort of the conundrum of the, uh, of the modern electronic or digital musician or video artist, which is you have the capability of completely saturating the audible space, 
Um, with mm-hmm. vis- with the proper visuals, you have the ability of completely saturating the visual space. Um, and obviously, you have to pull back some when you do collaboration. But to a certain extent, sometimes, uh, or maybe often, um, our sense of what one of the one of the things that makes electronic uh, music and uh, sort of live cinema sort of exciting and interesting is the fact that it does occupy a large amount of space. How do you make decisions about um, the give and take, the ebb and flow of working with a collaborator without losing the edge that comes with doing uh, live live media work and uh, live sound, basically li- real-time sound design? Yes, yeah, so I suppose I should, I should mention that the unique aspect of what we do is that we sonify the same data that, that determines or drives the visual experience is the same data that you hear. So all of the decisions that we're making all the time about the, the material as we're creating it uh, is, does this make sense sonically and imagistically, both together and then individually? And if somehow it doesn't, maybe it's like awesome visually, but the sound just cannot be coaxed out of it, then we sort of go, well, that's great, but we'll use it for something else. We can't use it for this. So A, a good idea all, that all, goes on a shelf. Yeah. So we're, all, we're always sort of juggling that even within our own system. And then when we bring others into it, um, it's e- I can say that it's, a, it's definitely significantly easier when we're working with one collaborator uh, versus... Uh, Three, uh, because then the possibilities are, are I mean, they, they just seem to be kind of endless uh, at that point. So the other, I guess the other thing I should say is that we do, we really, Noitzold really likes to work in a long format. Uh, we uh, have a commission right now for a 15 minute piece, but typically we really think of about a 45 to an hour and a half kind of time frame, And it has to do with certain to, to use an over uh, an overused and, and somewhat devalued word, uh, we we work in a kind of trance like mode uh, that requires long longer spans of time for it, the work to make even make sense. So, uh, and I think that's important in terms of this idea of give and take because it means that we do have moments where we can really we really can build it up and be dense in, in terms of both electronic sound, visual activity, and and uh, different aspects of the acoustic performance. But we, ba- we always try to balance that off uh, with, uh, with qu- quiet moments or still moments of various sorts or letting the acoustic trio come to the fore and that we can kind of retreat or vice versa. And so uh, one thing that's becoming much more sort of apparent in the new work is this idea of different people taking solos uh, uh, and various, you know, duets, uh, trios, and uh, and then moments where it, uh, suddenly trio cause and noiseful become this quintet. Uh, suddenly, we're all we're sort of all uh, performing together. So, we, uh, you know, you, you see these kinds of things, of course, in the classic uh, symphonic forms, where all kinds of different over the span of time, all kinds of different relationships are explored. So. That, you know, we just keep we just bear that in mind when we're designing something. Okay, that's that's cool. Now, my my one question I have, having seen a number of your performances, mm-hmm. is how much of it is composed, how much of it is improvised, or um, how and how much do you live sort of like in the center line between those two? <laughs> you know, that's um, that's kind of a hard, uh, I mean, I know the answer to that, but it's hard to communicate because <laughs> it is very, very composed uh, it, from the, the sense that we, uh, we know the order of events. We, uh, we're able to replicate those, sp- those spaces, worlds, or movements, or sections, however you want to think about them, uh, because, because they're saved as, as presets within the computer. Uh, so we're able to call them them up, but within those, 
we uh, the programming there's a certain amount of um, feedback, so nonlinear behavior, and, uh, and different aspects of just the way the sensors are controlling things that are always going to be slightly different. As is the uh, so within, uh, so we usually have kind of I would say a goal within any given movement that we will move through certain terrain or we will you know the material will climax in a certain way or it'll take this a dynamic shape it may actually be the inverse of a climax and may, it actually may start out sort of coherent and fall apart whatever it is that we're we're trying to do we we can replicate however. It is, uh, it's not quite like we are working from a a score where we're trying to hit every note exactly the same every night. And we might actually go, well, this, you know, this audience is going to be a little more of a quiet audience. So let's expand this section and shorten this section. Or we might go, this is going to be a little bit more of a high energy, edgy audience. So why don't we pull out this more noisy stuff here? So we can we can we can vary it and alter it, and we can alter the length of things. But we always, pretty much, always keep the same order of of the piece with the same objectives that we compose. So it really is both. We are improvising within a highly structured framework. Right. Um. I think it's really interesting that you talk about actually having some sensitivity towards the audience, which is something, it's a kind of freedom that you get when you have that improvisational aspect to your work. But um, you also earlier said uh, that data is being used to sort of drive both the visuals and the audio. And um, first of all, where, where is that data coming from? Well, so um, Corey and I have been developing, we developed one system, uh, and then now we've we've rewritten it into a modular format so that we can literally sort of instantiate and move around modules, processing modules of various sorts. And the con, I mean, very much this comes out of the history of modular synthesis, both uh, the, the more common one we know about, which is audio, but of course there are all these pioneers working in, with video systems that develop video synthesizers of various sorts. So we have a combined uh, virtual system that's both audio and visual, but it, it, in a lot of ways it's, we can also think of it as data synthesizer, and even though we haven't written these modules yet, I mean, if we if we want to scrub data from the internet or use various tables of data that are data sets from science uh, and or, yeah, well, science and engineering, et cetera, we, we will be able to do that. So that's something that we're looking at in the future because we have also some collaborations that are, are, are stepping outside the arts slightly. Um, and so within this synthesis environment, for instance, we have a, a, a database of 3D uh, models. Uh, of uh, We have some that we've designed ourselves, and then we have more math- math- stuff that's based more on procedural mathematics. Uh, and so uh, we have that. We have an a, a ongoing database of video. Um, pre- we do have pre-recorded elements, but they serve basically as um, video files that... Um, are used uh, to, to cover three-dimensional surfaces and or we actually sonify the, uh, you know, we extract data or, uh, you know, we do a lot of chrominance and luminance uh, processing and, and take the data from that to drive different aspects of sound. Uh, and it's really kind of interesting how we use video because, uh, you know, a lot of live cinema is just 2D video being mixed live we actually use these little, a lot of little video clips and ex- use them as alpha channel. Uh, we, we actually use them to mix the alpha channel between three-dimensional models to create all kinds of topologies, 3D visual topologies. At the same time, we're using the movie to drive sound, and you never actually really see the movie. You just see the movie acting as a kind of score of its own, extruding 3D space and, and triggering sounds. That's actually interesting that you bring that out because um, 
So uh, I know a lot about the kind of technologies that you're using in the background, but there were certain kind of um, there's certain kinds of activities that I had seen, particularly seen the 3D models do, that I was like, wow, to sort of program that functionally uh, seems a little mind-boggling. But when you think of using a, a video clip as sort of a data driver for geometry, mm-hmm. all of a sudden I can now see how some of that would uh, would be more doable. It's a really interesting concept. Yeah, so we're, we're doing that. And then, of course, we're also using a lot of feedback um, within the 3D environment. So it, it, it borrows from the pioneers of, of early electronic video processing, that, that thread within video art, uh, but applies it to a 3D world. And it's pretty fantastic what the kinds of specifically kinetic, like the, the organic kinds of visual behaviors the, uh, in terms of motion that happen. And, the, and some of that is the, the most fun to perform because it, well, it's, un, it's unpredictable, it, which means you, uh, and so this is one of the things Corey and I often do, especially with the earlier, uh, the first work we were doing, really had more to do with us trying to tame the system <laughs> as a form of performance than actually coax it to do something. Uh, now we're, you know, we kind of know how to do both. And so, uh, we, we go back and forth, but the, 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 mo- the next projects that we're going to be working on, we're, we're actually looking forward to doing some work, just the two of us again. And we're going to go back into the, some of the feedback stuff and some of the, the noisier, edgier things, uh, and sort of try to take that to a new level. Cause we had put that a little bit on the back burner in the last few years. Right. Well, working with feedback is always kind of some version of white knuckling anyway, so that's, yeah. uh, I, can, I, I can see why it's enjoyable performance. But let's talk a little bit about the aspects of performance. When you talk about your history, you actually talk about a lot of kinds of artwork that are not performative or not naturally performative. Mm-hmm. But um, the expression of the noise fold work that I'm most familiar with, and I think something that has got garnered you a fair amount of attention, has been the fact that you're taking these art forms and making them performative in some variety of ways. Um, what for you? What what did you have to change, or where did you have to draw inspiration in order to take things and make them performative? And how do you sort of like design the arc of a performance? Um, when you have so many different media types and so so many different tools at hand. Okay, well, yeah. So I, I definitely uh, have spent a long time, uh, really, when I was younger, with things that weren't performative, uh, uh, drawing and painting to be one. How, however, I mean, it actually goes back to my very earliest childhood because I had a, a rather remarkable art teacher who um, would do finger paintings to music and these finger paintings that she would do, uh, she were sort of involved her whole body. Like she would use her elbows, her wrists, her knuckles, various um, textural things. And she would do these things really fast, kind of like a Zen approach where an image would just sort of emerge within like four or five minutes. Uh, um, and she did it to music and it was like, this is something that only recently I started to think, oh my God, this thing that I experienced when I was like eight years old, uh, left an indelible mark in my mind about the fact that the visual form could actually be a kind of musical gestural form. So, uh, so it goes, it goes way back, but my own work at first was really, you know, drawing and painting, uh, writing, and even when I got into electronic music, the approach was, oh, electronic music is like, it's this plastic form, like ceramics or painting, because you work on a tape, well, originally a tape, but I, you know, so I wrote a lot of songs and a lot of abstract sound pieces and all that kind of thing, very focused on the object. So, uh, but I always enjoyed performing, and I studied dance quite seriously, but seriously more from the perspective of looking at 
the stage as a total experience. And a lot of what I was doing with dance was multiple projection environments with dancers and 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 sound. So I was really looking at that total thing. But I worked a lot. The experience of working with dancers is also very improvisational. Uh, you try a lot of things with you know the physical body with multiple people and all of that. So um, so performance was always in there, but it was always kind of the performance of a giant picture, if you will. It was always like thinking of it as this this kind of imagistic space. And I know Corey's background, like likewise, is very much in theater. And he's he. I mean, I can't say enough about how uh, an, what an amazing performer Corey is. Like it's it's his real um, artistic strengths. And I've worked with a few dancers, very few that sort of innately got how to um, how to interact with virtual material. It isn't like everyone can do it, but some people that can really do it, it's, uh, it's kind of a mystery. Why are they so good at it? I, uh, it's sort of innate. And so I would definitely say Corey, Corey has that, that quality. Um, and so I, I don't know. I, I have a love-hate re- relationship somewhat with the idea of now, because I've, I've made a lot of video pieces that are, are you know, fixed, fixed media pieces, and that was a, was a real focus for me for a while. But now committing to a fixed piece, I, I, there's something about performance that just is extremely exciting, uh, really demanding, and also freeing. And... Um, so I, I can't imagine not doing performance work, but we, uh, with the new system, hardware stuff that we're using these days, it is really easy for us to make HD recordings of, every, of, our, of our performances and also of our sketches. So I have a feeling that you're going to see um, some fixed media work coming out from us again, even though it's going to be a little bit more, I mean, music is the best is really the best model I can, I can look at uh, because as performers, that seems to come first and anything that we, we do that's going to be recorded is going to have a, a performative element when it's captured as opposed to, you know, storyboarded out really precisely and then edited piece by piece together. That isn't really the approach that we take. It's going to be uh, performative with a, a certain amount of post-production. So it's, it's much more like how one would perform making an LP probably. So I, I do see us doing that. Anyway, you had another question about uh, more about the, the, the designing of, of everything. Well, or? just, um, yeah, all of these things in your work, all of these things start to blur First of all, you know, in addition to doing performance, you sort of design the the performative thing. And we talked a little bit before about how you design the movements and uh, you have these structures that you work within for your performance and you design that. But there's also another element to design that's really important for your work, and that is the graphic design. I feel like we're still in an age where people have a tendency to to preference the technology over the art. So that it's it's very exciting if you're using cool tech, even if it doesn't have a very deep artistic uh, nature to it. And I, I suffer yeah. from this as much as anyone else. Sometimes in the heat of preparing for a performance or for an installation, you're so fo- focused on even making the technology work that uh, there's a celebration for the fact that the technology made it. You know, and... Um, mm-hmm. But there is... there. You know, for this to be artwork, there needs to be sort of the artful side of it as well. And I think that you guys take this on from a number of ways. First of all, I know that you've worked with a lot of sort of detailed models, whether it's predator prey models or whatever, as sort of a starting and and, uh, a a kickoff point for some of the work that you've done, which kind of adds to the organic movement and styles that are are Mm -hmm. brought to bear. But also the graphic design that is applied on the models, what what you use for surface textures and stuff are impeccable. And um, your use of color palettes and the changing color palette over the course of a performance. And some of these things, are, they're very, to me, they're quite unique within, the, within this, uh, this space because uh, you have very 
aggressive technology, but you also are very aggressive about the art design. Can you talk a little bit yeah. about about uh, the, how you decide to do that? And uh, I mean, it's probably just saying I decided, but <laughs> <laughs> but how you actually sort of enforce that for yourself so that you don't get so wrapped up in the technology side of it that the, that the art goes goes void. Yeah, well, you know, uh, anecdotally, when oftentimes when we're doing Q and A kind of stuff, the, the, there are many more questions about the tech than anything else, and the, and and over and over again, there there is this kind of undercurrent. Well, sometimes it's an undercurrent. Sometimes it's just very very blatant uh, that that people want to know what the software is because they honestly believe it's the software that if if you have the right software, then the art makes itself. Um, and and it's it's fun, it's laughable and funny, but that of course you do in the in the case of what we're doing, we've needed to put together the right complement of software there's no there's no doubt about it but that's no guarantee of of anything of course and it's always in service uh, uh, typically that we have like an idea that we want to explore and putting together the you know a new module uh in the software is going to allow us to explore that idea uh so it's always really it's always really driven uh usually by concepts like you're talking about uh, with the one exception that I will say, and it's the sort of reason to work in a, in a modular synthesis environment, that we really are at the same time creating a field of possibilities to explore uh, in. And, and so, and Corey and I usually talk about that, but Corey is the programmer amongst us. And so he, uh, he'll work on stuff and then we'll put it together and we'll look at it. And it, 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 it will, in and of itself, suggest ways of approaching the image and sound. And then I'll go into those environments and just work at them. And I, I do really, I kind of very much compare it to sort of two activities. Uh, one would be drawing and painting, and the, the other would be music composition, and specifically electronic music composition. So it's sort of all those things as a hybrid at, uh, at the same time. So there's a lot of exploration and a lot of sketching. Like for any given performance that we do, that let's say it has, uh, you know, nine movements or something like that, uh, there, may, there actually may have been 25 movements with a bunch of sub-presets uh, sub, uh, and stuff, sections, that never got used. And, and so that, that idea really comes from filmmaking and uh, video editing and filmmaking where you, ha- you have your footage and you, you throw away most of it. So, th- so there's that aspect of it. And then there's the other aspect, which I think really comes out of my painting background. So that's where the sensitivity to color, uh, a, lot of, a lot of noise fold stuff, uh, the early stuff used almost only video noise textures that were either blue and white or black and white. Uh, so we started with a really limited tech, uh, color palette, and we've got increasingly more, uh, I'd say, richer that way. But then we always kind of pull back from that, too. So we do a lot of black and white stuff. Um, do you do that, I, because, I, do the, do that because you're trying to avoid sort of like the Disney wow factor? If I'm talking about all these things I do, but the one thing I haven't said is I never trained as a as a 3D animator. I'm really coming at this from from video, from live action video and music, and I always kind of whoa. I think Corey agrees with me on this a little bit. A lot of the the 3D uh, CGI world that we've grown up on, and it's you know it's gotten it's gotten increasingly more amazing in terms of trying to render a re- reality. But we, you know, a lot of it uses like these rainbow color palettes or everything is just pushed over the top. And I think by pulling back, uh, one of the exciting things that, that happens when you pull back from a couple of, you know, from a, from really you know, like rich and bright colors into more muted colors or 
uh, pulling back uh, in terms of the complexity of a visual form so that you allow its motion to actually come to the fore. By pulling back on certain things, other things can be made manifest. So, uh, so it's a really interesting. I'm taking this this thought a little bit in a different direction, but this idea of of, um, of reality or do, doing being very realistic, noise fold actually is very kind of surrealistic, and we uh, we do things that have these qualities, what I'll just call lifelike or biomimetic qualities to them, but at the same time, they're they're really uh, very synthetic and very, and, and very um, stripped down. And I think that's one of the reasons that when you take you you t- kind of take one thing that's obviously very uh, fake, if you will, or contrived, but imbue it with aspects of natural world, whether it's texture or uh, motion, it somehow becomes that much more amazing as a kind of a an artificial life form, if you will, uh, precisely because it's not trying to be an animatronic human. <laughs> Right, wow. that's true. Well, it's it's interesting because you're right. Most of the time when we see 3D work, it has sort of a Sonic the Hedgehog kind of quality to it, mm-hmm. which is like bombastic colors, brightness, and everything. One of the things that I notice in, in your performances is that maybe one of the reasons that I'm so sensitive to the color palette that's used and stuff is because um, you use color as sort of a great spice rather than as the main course. We we do, and I pretty much, I mean, we have moved much more to a more vibrant color space in the last three years, for sure. Uh, but, I, I, I don't know, I say that, but at the moment we're kind of pulling back into a lot of black and white stuff, and we really like just the effect that it has if we do 20 minutes of black and white and sudden and suddenly we give you red. Right. The red then becomes this like, oh my God, that's red. Uh, it lets it be, be something instead of just hitting you over the head with the rainbow right at the right beginning. On. So, so we're, yeah, we're really, we're very conscious of that. And then there's this, I suppose this other, other interesting thing about, about the digital world. And, that, and that's just the, notion that we can think that we are moving towards and uh, this this idea that we can simulate anything uh, you know whether it's it's hair or lace or gravel or metal or the quality of someone's voice or the quality of someone's gait um, it's it can all be simulated and so we're um, we're working this you know this highly simulated realm and so what I'm Looking at you know you know it, it's not it, it's not like I sit there and study it it's it happens to be with all those years of studying and looking uh, is really looking at at the the history of painting if if you will and photography uh, and if we're simulating anything it's like the, it, we're simulating the restraint that a lot of visual artists had to their materials and we're adopting that same thing so we're, we're really not even remotely interested in rendering a photographically uh, perfect world. We're, we're, I'm, you know, at any given time, I know one piece we have called III, which is a three-screen installation. Uh, it was inspired <clears throat> by a kind of a hypothetical cutout paper sculpture, like how could we do a virtual uh, uh, visual space. This one doesn't have sound, actually. Uh, that looks like fabrics and sort of cut paper. So and so, there is a little tiny bit. It's mostly white with black, with with black uh, cuts, I guess, if you will, or windows or various creases and things in the texture, uh, with an occasional sort of uh, dribble of green or red that almost is never there, just every once in a while appears. Unfortunately, we've, we've kind of run out of time here. I don't want to waste any more of your time, and I have kids that are going to be screaming for me here shortly. Um, but one of the things I would like to do is um, give people an opportunity. I, we have, I, I wish I had like five hours to talk to you about this stuff because you're diving into some really important aspects of uh, the visual arts of 
live media, live cinema work, live electronic uh, music and and visual work, all of these things, you're, you're diving into some really important mm-hmm. territory. And I really wish that uh, that we could have many more hours to discuss it. Maybe we'll pick this up, up again shortly for a part two. I would really like to do that. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, for those uh, listeners who haven't had a chance to see you live, see you live or see any of your installation work, uh, where would be the best place for them to go and uh, catch a little bit of hopefully some visuals on what you've been doing? Well, I think our website, which is www.noisefold.com, which has a lot of, of uh, still images, but also the Vimeo links, uh, is a good place to start. All right. Well, that's, that's great, because I think that you have uh, really stimulated some important brain cells, and I hope uh, the listeners respond uh, as well as I have. So thank you so much, David, for your time. I really appreciate it. This has been a fascinating discussion. Um, I totally enjoyed it myself. All right. And one last thing. Uh, you teach down at UNT. Uh, you're in the music department there, right? Actually, I started in the music department, but now I have a joint position, which is between composition and the College of Music, and which is my... This, 60% of my load and 40% in the College of Visual Art in the new media program. And I work with a lot of students who, uh, I work with a lot of new media students who also do sound art and or live cinema or robotics. And then I work with a lot of composers. Um, but I'm, I'm a uh, part and a uh, leader of a research cluster called IARTA, the Initiative for Advanced Research in Technology and Arts, which is really focused on different kinds of collaboration. So um, I have not been working as much with dancers lately, but, you know, there's another university in Denton, uh, the Texas Women's University, which has one of the leading uh, graduate programs in dance in the U.S. So I'm now... Um, actually combining uh, some of the grad students from the dance program at TWU with the composers and the new media artists at UNT. Well, that's awesome. I'm going to have to come visit sometime. Uh, I'm a, oh, yeah. I'm a fail, failed alum of uh, <laughs> uh, UNT, and my ex-wife came from T, uh, TWU, so there you go. It's got all kinds of uh, scars for me, so I'm <laughs> surely going to have to come out to Denton soon. Thanks a lot for your time. Yes, you are. I appreciate it. Catch you later. Okay. Bye. Thanks, Darwin. Bye. Well, how's that for a sip out of the fire hose? A lot of information. I'm actually going to schedule a part two with David at some soon point because it's pretty amazing. Uh, The amount of thought that he's put into his work. uh, We really, I really like this kind of thing. To me, uh, learning how people work and how they make their decisions is always very interesting. So again, if you want to check out their work, you can uh, check out noisefold.com and find out more about what they're doing. Got a lot of exciting interviews coming up over the next couple of weeks. Uh, I hope you stick with us. Share this with your friends. Let everybody know. We want to get more listeners. Uh, those numbers are looking really good right now, though. I really appreciate everyone's attention. And um, I'll catch you next week. Thanks. Bye. Bye.